Uh, welcome everyone. This is the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative uh, and the University of Minnesota Extension Forestry Webinar. Um, welcome everyone to today's uh, presentation. Uh, we're really excited to have uh, our talk today um, by John Steigerwalt with the Rough Grass Society. Uh, John is going to be presenting from uh, Spooner, Wisconsin. Um, uh, I'm here in St. Paul. A couple of us are here in St. Paul. Uh, welcome to all of our broadcast site locations uh, throughout the state. Uh, welcome to those of you watching online. Um, really happy to have you here. Um, and so happy to get this webinar started as well. Uh, we did want to introduce you to the Zoom system. Uh, you should be seeing John's slides uh, in front of you now. Um, there's also videos on the side. You should be seeing my face and my audio coming through. Um, there are ways to adjust that if you want to um, by looking at the top and uh, there are different views that you can have of Zoom. Um, but you should be seeing the slides nonetheless, uh, so those should be in front of you um, here. And um, the things we want to let you know about, uh, we really encourage you to ask questions, uh, to have comments, uh, and the best way to do that is through the Zoom webinar chat. Uh, and so that should be, typically it's over on the right side of the Zoom system, uh, and we really encourage you to uh, post questions there, uh, post comments there as you have them, as they come about, uh, as you're listening to the webinar. Um, and what we'll do is we'll relay those messages and those questions to John as he goes through uh, today. Um, a couple of other updates. I know the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative uh, Research Review, uh, I think registration is open for that. Yep. Um, and so uh, I'm sure we'll share a link to that sometime during the webinar today. Uh, and then we've also got next year's webinars planned um, as well. Um, and so we'll, we'll share a link to that, I'm sure, uh, sometime through the webinar. Uh, today. So uh, that's kind of the housekeeping. Housekeeping's in order, uh, so we want to get to the webinar. Um, and so we're really excited to have John Stegerwalt uh, with the Rough Gauss Society to present uh, to us today. Uh, just quickly looking at the attendee list uh, before we started, it's great to see a lot of forestry people and a lot of wildlife people uh, joining us today. Um, and rough grouse is certainly a species that integrates both forest management and wildlife management. Um, and so uh, also, there's a lot of uh, issues with rough grouse. I know John is going to mention West Nile uh, and what that has, some results uh, that have recently come in uh, from the impacts of West Nile on rough grouse populations. Um, and so we're really excited to have this webinar today. So with that, um, I will turn it over to John. And I will mention John does not have a webcam, uh, so you shouldn't be seeing any video from John, uh, but you should be seeing his audio come through uh, about now. Uh, so John, take it away. Thank you, Matt. Uh, good to be here. Um, this has been a sort of a long time coming when, when Matt asked me to do a presentation. Um, I told him maybe in December we can do it just with all the things uh, that are coming about with, with rough grouse as of recently. Uh, Wisconsin, uh, Minnesota, Michigan, of course, doing our West Nile virus sampling, the hunting season itself, and then uh, Wisconsin trying to finalize a rough grouse management plan. So I'm thankful for the opportunity to come and, and, and speak. Uh, and for those of you who are, who are listening in to, to hear what I have to say. Um, but we're going to talk basically about uh, some rough grouse updates and implications um, for management. I've broken this down into to three main sections. I'll jump around a little bit. I apologize. It really gets down to how my brain functions and works. Um, but I promise it will all make sense and come together um, in the end. I do get a long, little long-winded sometimes, so I may end up skipping... Um, a portion in the middle just to keep us on track to be wrapped up by one o'clock. But uh, with that, uh, my name is John Steigerwalt. I'm the regional biologist uh, for the Rough Grouse Society covering Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, and Illinois. And let's talk about grouse. Um, before we, we really dive in, I know that uh, we have some listeners who are uh, private non-industrial landowners in addition to our forestry and wildlife professionals. So I just want to run us through a, a general uh, rough grouse refresher. Uh, that night I've had some people reach out to me about this webinar um, from out on uh, eastern United States who aren't totally familiar with with managing rough grouse. So just just do a really quick uh, refresher on rough grouse themselves. Um, they are an upland non-migratory game bird. They are the most widely distributed resident upland game bird in North America. Um, they're one of 10 native grouse species in North America. Sometimes you'll hear them referred to as chicken-like in size and morphology. 
I have chicken like in quotation marks for a reason that's not necessarily true. They, they are quite a bit smaller than a chicken. Um, the best way that I, I find to describe them is if you're familiar with a hen pheasant, they, they look like a hen pheasant with the tail feathers clipped off. Um, that's probably the best best way to get an idea of their size, uh, size and weight, but they are about 15 to 20 inches long, a two foot wingspan and weigh between one and two pounds. Um, as I mentioned, they are the most widely distributed uh, resident upland game bird in North America. Um, here's our, our distribution map from uh, Rush et al. You can see that they, they go far up into Canada, Alaska, um, Northern Rocky Mountains, Great Lakes, uh, Eastern New England, and down through the Appalachian Mountains. The term ruffed refers to an umbrella-like tuft of dark, long feathers along either side of the neck. Um, we have two typical uh, general color phases that exist. Gray, the gray phase, which is probably the most common in the lake states, and the red phase, which is like a reddish brown color. Um, rough grouse themselves are monomorphic. Males and females look very similar, if not identical at times. Probably the most iconic thing about rough grouse uh, is their drumming. That's something where, um, you know, when I go and talk to private non-industrial landowners about forest management and rough grouse, I, I ask in the room how many people have ever seen a rough grouse. Usually about 75% of the people in the, the room raise their hands saying they've seen a rough grouse. Uh, being a landowner, it's pretty common, at least in Wisconsin, Minnesota. Uh, but when I ask how many people have heard a rough grouse, Usually everyone in the room raises their hands because that's probably one of the more iconic things uh, about rough grouse is this um, non-vocal uh, acoustic mating display uh, known as drumming. Uh, the drumming itself is a mating slash territorial display, usually done in April and May. However, grouse can drum at other times of the year um, uh, as a territorial display, especially when the broods are breaking up in the fall. You can you can on occasion hear rough grouse drumming in the fall. Um, what happens is that the grouse are, are seeking out a log, a rock, a stump, or something to use as essentially a stage um, that they can prop themselves up and make themselves kind of um, more noticeable, more audible. Um, but usually there's actually some very specific things they're looking for habitat wise in that immediate area of that that drumming log. And that is they're looking for a high density of small trees and a high ground layer visibility um, on that drumming log to, to make that, that display. The beat in the wings creates a miniature sonic boom. Uh, again, I've got that in quotation marks because so you'll hear that uh, quite often on occasion, um, that sonic boom. It's not really a sonic boom. It more or less is the um, beating of, of, of the wings through the air that creates that sound. And I've got a, an audio here. I hope it comes through on your guys' end of, of the rough grouse drumming. I don't know if, if some of you were able to hear that or not, but uh, um, just a, a sample of that. And of course, because of this, uh, this non-vocal mating display, it it allows us to do a relatively unique thing with rough grouse that we can't necessarily do with other game birds. And that's have a, a non-vocal acoustic sampling of, of rough grouse. Um, if you're a hunter, uh, forestry or wildlife professional or a landowner um, in the Lake States, you are probably very familiar with uh, rough grouse drumming survey data. Um, you've probably have heard it at one point in time, especially if you're a hunter, um, trying to follow the season to determine where, where we are in the population um, to kind of um, hone in on, on what you think your hunting success is gonna be. But this drumming allows us as professionals to, to monitor the population over time. Um, what essentially happens to conduct the drumming survey, if you don't know, is that drivers have fixed routes in, in each county, uh, at least in Wisconsin, that they go out and year after year, they stop at the same location for a set period of time, and they simply listen. And what they're listening for are the number of rough grouse drums at that stop um, from different individuals to basically help us index the population over time. That's maybe a little bit of confusion that uh, um, 
uh, some of the non-professionals have as far as what a drumming survey is and what it tells us. It's not really a population estimate. It's really just enabling us to index the population um, based upon that drumming um, that the grouse do in the springtime. We can really determine is the population going up, down, or staying the same based upon um, how many drums we hear um, at, at any given time. And with that data, we can do some unique things. We can break the uh, those drumming surveys out into really different regions so we can figure out what is the um, population doing in different regions of the state and even down into a, a county by county basis. Um, this, this particular slide, we, we see that we have northern Wisconsin, southwestern uh, Wisconsin, so we can see how the different population trends have, have gone over time. One of the other ways we can monitor the rough grouse population is by examining um, hunter harvest data. Um, this, this slide is basically a few, few different things that this slide is, is uh, telling us is that the number of hunters we have in any given year hunting rough grouse, the number of days of field um, for their overall effort of, of hunting rough grouse, and the overall harvest. So it's another um, set of data that we can look at to, to monitor rough grouse uh, over time to kind of key in as far as what the population is doing. Of course, coming up with a, an actual population estimate is, is pretty, um, pretty darn intensive and expensive to actually do. Uh, so we utilize these drumming surveys and these hunter harvest surveys uh, to really help us get an idea of, of what the population is doing as, as sort of a go around for the, the time and expense it would take to actually um, come up with a population estimate. Um, and using, using this data, of course, we can develop trends over time as far as what's going on uh, with the population and key us into some of the, the concerns we might have with that population. Uh, now looking at Wisconsin's drumming counts, uh, Wisconsin's been doing our drumming counts going back to 1964. Um, next slides, I've, I've got Minnesota's drumming counts. They've been going back to the 1940s. Um, a few things pop out with the drumming survey. Um, of course, one of the other things, if, if you follow rough grouse um, and the drumming surveys, you understand there's a decadal cycle that goes on with rough grouse. Um, every nine to 11 years, essentially, there's a peak in a valley um, in the rough grouse population. Of course, what causes that we, as Researchers, scientists, and managers, we really don't know. Um, even Gordon Gillian, uh, the grandfather of, of rough grouse management, he didn't fully understand it or at least reach a conclusion. But we think it may have something to do with uh, predator prey cycles, disease cycles, um, climate, weather patterns, those sort of things. They may, in fact, cause uh, the cycle itself in, in the lake states. Um, but we had this, this decadal cycle going on for a long time. And of course, one of the reasons why rough grouse is on people's radar, at least in the past couple of years, has been because in 2017, uh, we had sort of an anomaly. We had something happen in 2017 in, in Wisconsin and Minnesota where these drumming surveys indicated that the population was on the uptick. Um, we're, we're seeing improvements in, in the number of drumming counts. We thought that maybe we were um, on the upswing of this uh, drumming of this cycle, and we had positive reports back in Minnesota and Wisconsin from uh, drumming surveys. But when it came down to the season, um, there were pretty dismal numbers as far as what hunters were seeing compared to uh, those those drumming counts and the overall hunter success. Um, and in fact, in 2018, we saw a dramatic decline in um, rough grouse. Uh, drumming counts in both Wisconsin and Minnesota. Uh, here's, here's Minnesota's. Again, we, we saw in 2017, we saw a, a actually for Minnesota, 47% increase in drumming counts, followed by that, that sharp decline in 2018. So that's what causes a lot of concerns as far as what is actually happening with rough grouse. We thought we were on the increase in the cycle, um, but kind of the bottom fell out. And that, that really prompted a lot of um, today's concerns, uh, just sort of, you know, 30,000 foot level looking at what these concerns are. Uh, 
course, West Nile virus is probably the biggest uh, buzzword and, and rough grouse that we hear about as a major concern. Right now, there's a three-state monitoring effort in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan, um, sampling over three years, trying to get a better understanding of, of West Nile virus and its impacts uh, on rough grouse. Um, we're learning more about equine or Eastern equine encephalitis virus, um, EEE, or sometimes we'll see it denoted as EEEV, same, same disease. Of course, there are some concerns about climate change, um, especially as it impacts as it's predicted to impact um, forest composition. Um, mainly Aspen is, is predicted to be a loser when it comes to climate change. Uh, weather patterns were something else that was of major concern. The past several years, we've had some heavy spring rains that have hit during that critical um, hatch period and, and brew during time where basically baby grouse were, were sm so small they could have gotten drowned out by some of the heavy spring rains that we saw. Um, of course, some questions also related to weather and climate with snow depth. We've had some pretty terrible years in the past few years when it comes to snow depth, which plays into the rough grouse's ability to evade predators and snow roost um, to thermoregulate their bodies in the wintertime. Um, thankfully, not a problem this year <laughs> with all the snow we've gotten in, in the lake states thus far. Um, also some concerns with predation, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a couple slides, um, how that kind of relates to everything else, and also changes in habitat. Uh, looking more in depth at West Nile virus and sort of what we know right now, you know, West Nile virus itself is an exotic disease, uh, exotic disease. It's transmitted by certain mosquitoes. Um, I'm not a disease expert by any stretch of the imagination. I'm, I'm a habitat expert, so I'm gonna keep this uh, to my, my level of, of expertise, uh, it's transmitted by certain mosquitoes. Um, it was first identified in the eastern United States in 1999, um, first identified in Wisconsin in 2001, uh, which in, we had the first human case in 2002. But what we know about the impacts on birds is that some bird species are more susceptible than others. Um, you know, what, when West Nile virus first showed up in the Lake States, there was a lot of concerns over the corvids and raptors. Uh, so our crows, jays, hawks, and eagles, which I'm sure we all remember were, were greatly impacted by, um, by West Nile virus back then. Rough grouse, what we know is that it may have less of an impact on, on rough grouse um, overall. It may not have um, the level of mortality that, uh, that it had had on crows and jays. But that brings us to the, um, the sampling effort for, for rough grouse uh, in, in West Nile virus. So 2018 was the first year that hunters submitted West Nile virus samples uh, to the DNR to, to be uh, tested for, for West Nile virus. And from that, Wisconsin submitted 235 samples overall. 29% um, of those had antibodies to West Nile virus, and only 0.9% of those had evidence of West Nile virus in the hearts of the birds that were submitted. Minnesota submitted 273 samples total. 12% of those had antibodies um, present, and 3% of those had evidence of West Nile virus in the hearts. Michigan, um, similarly, 213 samples submitted, 13% had antibodies, and 4% had evidence of West Nile virus in the hearts. Just sort of looking at that data set, well, big that pops out to a lot of people, Wisconsin, we had 29% of our birds had antibodies. That sounds like a lot of doom and gloom. And also looking at Minnesota, 12%, Michigan, 13%. But what the data is really telling us is that the birds, while they're getting West Nile virus, there seems to be some, some level of survivability. Um, they're developing antibodies to West Nile virus, which could help with their, their survival. Now, there are some questions as far as, um, how that impact uh, from West Nile virus could weaken the birds, make them more susceptible to um, predation, exposure, especially going into the winter months. Um, there are also some questions as far as how many birds are dying um, between the, the, uh, the drumming counts and the hunting season, because of course these birds are submitted through a hunter harvest survey. So there's a period during the year when um, 
West Nile virus itself is active and we're not actually sampling birds. So there are some concerns as far as how many birds are really dying during that period. But at least what we know right now is that the birds are developing antibodies. There seems to be some survivability, which is a, a positive. Um, with Eastern equine cephalitis, we're, we're sort of relearning this one. It is a native disease. It was first identified in Wisconsin in the 1950s. And we've known that it has caused die-offs in other, um, other birds, but mostly exotic bird species like pheasant. Um, there is one study in 1957 that found uh, EEE in 50% of rough grouse, but it really hasn't been something that's been on our radar because we've, we've known that it is a native disease. It, uh, it's been around a long time and we've kind of been humming along just fine with, uh, um, with the rough grouse population. So it really wasn't something that was on any of our radar until this most recent uh, sampling effort for West Nile virus that we started to pick up on EEE. And it's something that we're going to have to monitor probably more closely going in the future, um, just in case there's any sort of synergistic effect uh, taking place with West Nile virus um, that can pre-expose uh, birds to predation um, or nat natural causes. But now looking at this list, you know, it's, it's key to understand that there could be some, some feedbacks in here, uh, especially with climate change. Um, one of the predictors for the Great Lakes region um, is showing that, well, we might, get, we might get wetter habitat, we might get wetter sort of climate here. If we have more moisture, we could have a, a higher mosquito population. If we have a higher mosquito population, we're going to see greater effects of West Nile virus and uh, EEE. That, of course, can weaken birds and um, uh, make them more susceptible to things like predation or even hunter harvest um, if they're not, uh, not fully um, capable of flying, if the birds are, are emaciated. Um, that, can, that change in climate or weather can also, of course, like I mentioned, we had some past several years of heavy spring rain. That could have had some impactors or influence on uh, uh, the mosquito population as well. Uh, same thing with, with snow depth. So there are some, some maybe some synergistic effects going on where these things are actually playing into themselves to influence the population. But just sort of looking at this list um, as managers, we know that we can't control West Nile virus. We know that we can't really control um, Eastern equine encephalitis, climate change, or the weather. Um, predation, maybe, but it's not really popular or, or even viable to really do. The biggest thing is list that we can actually impact is habitat um, and the changes in habitat. And I would, I would just like to um, quote Mark Wateka, the Upland um, game bird ecologist for the Wisconsin DNR, and that he, he said that our continued efforts to provide quality young forest habitat for rough grouse is our best strategy to maintain a healthy grouse population that can handle impacts from stressors such as disease and weather. Um, I, I think that kind of puts it in the context that, that really that is our, our best chance, our best hope to create a healthier population of rough grouse that can maybe handle some of these, these other factors. Um, so that, that's what the rest of this talk is really going to dive into is about changes in habitat we've seen and, and what we can do about it um, to help create a healthier population. So with that, let's get into some, some rough grouse conservation. Um, kind of just, again, kind of some more background information kind of set the stage. Rough grouse require diverse forest uh, to create the best suitable habitat. Um, we commonly think of rough grouse as a, a young forest species, uh, which is true. They, they do require young forest and it's um, it is really important to to rough grouse habitat, but it, it's maybe a little bit misleading as a lot of us go out hunting um, in the fall. We're really going out into one of the forest types that rough grouse are using throughout the year, and we're kind of um, biasing ourselves to think that rough grouse only utilize young forest habitat or that that's the most important type of habitat. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how rough grouse is a habitat specialist but it's not really a specialist for young forest habitat. It's really a specialist for diverse forest habitat. 
and I guess why why diverse forest habitat matters is that during different times of the year, rough grouse are using different forest habitats. We already mentioned during that drumming part of their life cycle, they're really keen in on um, a drumming log that is surrounded by a high by a high density of small trees and a high ground layer visibility. Kind of, we can think anecdotally, the reason they're, they're looking for that is the small tree density gives them some certain level of protection from avian predators, easy escapability um, if they're detected by a predator, um, and a, same thing with a high ground layer visibility. They can both see a mate at, as well as a competitor, as well as a predator. So anecdotally, we can kind of think that's what they're looking for, drumming. Um, drumming habitat. Their nesting habitat can be quite variable and the next slide will kind of dive more into that. During the brood rain period of the life cycle, they're really looking for open areas with a dense ground layer cover and herbaceous layer. layer. A lot of what they're looking for there uh, for brood is access to um, buds, flowers, insects, um, probably most importantly, seeds, those sort of things. Um, usually stands that are 10 to 20 years old, as well as utilizing wetland habitats uh, like tag alder. Foraging habitat, uh, your typically stands that are 25 years old. Uh, research kind of shows a 36 year average age in, in forest habitat. Uh, during the winter, um, rough grouse will, will do a couple of unique things. Um, they'll do a, a kind of a not, not a phenomenon, but an interesting characteristic called budding. Um, well, actually, unrelated individuals um, will coalesce essentially in a high quality food source, a mature aspen tree, and feed off of aspen buds. They'll also seek out conifer cover um, to help thermal regulate their bodies, as well as uh, snow roosting um, in a nice, soft, fluffy snow to help not only uh, evade predators, but also thermal regulate their bodies. Diving in more, um, more specifically, this comes from um, research from Gordon Gillian. I think it, it illustrates kind of the point um, pretty good. On the top, we have essentially a, a diagram of, of forest succession of a aspen mixed hardwood stand over time. Um, we have the, the age on top. On the bottom, we have the aspen stem density. Um, Per acre of that stand. So we can look at the succession of that, that stand over time. On the bottom we have a diagram of forest use. So looking at um, the different life cycle stages that rough grouse are utilizing that mixed aspen hardwood forest. So we can see that during that brood, brood rearing time or that brood cover time they're really keying in on young aspen stands, um, really less than 10 years old. And that, that's maybe why I, I say that a lot of hunters of rough grouse kind of key in on that being the most important part of uh, rough grouse habitat, because that's the time that most hunters are going out. They're utilizing that young forest habitat um, to hunt in, because that's where they're finding the birds during that particular time of the year. But then looking outside of just that brood, um, that brood time when those um, birds are breaking up and dispersing, we can start looking at, well, stands between about 10 and 25 years old, they're utilizing for breeding cover, which quickly dips off after 25 years um, and then picks up later on as that forest starts to develop a, sh a shrub layer, another story. So about 40 years going out to 60 years where there's that shrub layer in the forest, um, birds will utilize that as breeding cover as well. And of course I mentioned um, winter feeding use, um, about 30 years being the most commonly used um, age for that winter feeding, but really a wide, wide use of forest age classes being utilized for, for winter feeding. And if we take a, even a further step back, really between the age of 10 and, and 80 years old, um, a rough grouse can utilize any of those age classes as nesting cover. So it really kind of shows us a, a large diversity in the, uh, the forest type that rough grouse are actually utilizing throughout the year, building on this concept that they're that yes, they are a young forest species, but they're a diverse forest species as well. Um, next several slides I have 
of our, our talking about Aspen management. Um, I know we've, we've got uh, quite a few professionals in this talk. So I'm, I'm going to skip ahead for the sake of time and get us in kind of the, the meat and bones and grizzle of the, the presentation. Um, just so we can, we can get to some questions at the end. But uh, I want, want to build, build in this idea um, that uh, Aspen is not the, the limiting factor for rough grouse. Um, young forest habitat is not even the limiting factor for grouse. It's dense cover. And it's dense cover and that utilization during those different parts of their life cycle that is the limiting factor um, for rough grouse. With that being said, um, you know, how, does, how do we get to the management implications? How does this, this type of stuff matter to us as, as managers? Um, uh, focusing in on, on Wisconsin, uh, again, I'm, I'm the Wisconsin uh, Rough Grouse Society biologist. This is the main bulk of my territory. Um, let's examine some of the, the forest changes over time, um, at least what we've noticed happening in Wisconsin. Um, Basically examining forestry inventory analysis data going back to 1983, which is really coarse, coarse scale data, but it gives us a, an idea of, of what's going on with, with forest habitat. Um, basically since 1983 in the state of Wisconsin, we've lost about 1.3 million acres of young forest habitat in that zero to 20 year age class. And this is why the Rough Grouse Society, you know, we're very strong proponents of young forest habitat because this trend of, of losing forest habitat in, in Wisconsin is not too dissimilar to much of the eastern United States. We're, we're really a, a force of, of driving home the message of the importance of young forest habitat because we've lost so much of it. Um, we still recognize that rough grouse are, diver are a diverse forest species, but we need to really identify um, the elephant in the room is that we're losing it. So since 1983 in Wisconsin, we've lost almost 1.3 million acres of young forest habitat. Um, at the same point in time, we've also gained about 1.7 million acres of forest habitat in Wisconsin. Um, I know this graph is a little underwhelming, um, looking at the changes in this dark green bar from 1983 to um, 2017, but understand that this is in millions of acres of forest habitat. So when we have a 16 million acre forest and we, we lose uh, over a million acres of it, it's not really that impressive on a, on a diagram, but it, it, uh, it definitely has impacts when it comes to um, the quality of forest habitat. So we know that, that we have lost uh, um, young forest habitat, at least in Wisconsin, but it's important to really kind of understand where, we're, where, where we are seeing these changes uh, regionally and both in species of trees. So we need to break Wisconsin down and kind of look at it regionally um, based upon this, this FIA data. Um, one of the reasons we do this, uh, we can look at FIA data on a county by county basis, but the, the statistics are pretty, are pretty weak. So we can't really make strong inferences so this is actually comes out of uh, Wisconsin's newly minted uh, rough grouse management plan, where we divided the state into five different regions uh, based upon um, characteristics in each of those regions, forest types, uh, uh, soil types, management history, and really breaking Wisconsin down into those five different regions and examining the FIA data where we have stronger statistics in those regions. We can see that each of these regions has basically had the same sort of history. No area of the state has been untouched by this loss in, in this zero to 20 year age class of forest. Um, probably the largest changes have happened in the central region, uh, the yellow, and as well as the southwest portion of Wisconsin. But what's surprising to a lot of the managers who were diving into the, the rough grouse management plan and some of the recommendations we were making in that plan is that really even northern Wisconsin where we have uh, vast forests and easy accessibility to markets is that we've seen declines in, in the percentage of young forest habitat. So after we examine where, where we are seeing these changes geographically, 
we have to really kind of understand, well, well, where are we seeing these changes in the forest types? Now, when we talk about rough grouse, we have to talk about aspen management. Aspen's even the, you know, the backdrop um, to my slides throughout this whole presentation, the aspen leaves. Aspen is, of course, very important to the management uh, of rough grouse. So examining the trends um, from 1983 to 2017 and looking at where we've had losses and gains in, in aspen management, um, we can see that we have lost aspen as an overall forest component. We have maybe done a better job of regulating what aspen we currently are managing. And by that, I, we don't see the types of peaks and valleys in the different age classes that we saw back in 1983. We see sort of more of a regulated, leveled out aspen resource that we have today. So what it kind of tells us that maybe we are losing aspen acreage in Wisconsin, but we're maybe doing a better job of how we're managing it. Um, but, but where we saw those losses, um, we can look at, well, we saw a lot of those losses on the private lands. We also saw some of it on the county and municipal lands throughout our state. Uh, so we can also identify where we are seeing the, those losses as, of aspen as a cover type. Because rough grouse utilize more species than just aspen, really because that cover is the limiting factor of rough grouse, we needed to examine well, where are we seeing changes in other forest types. So examining the northern hardwood type um, based upon that FIA data in, in Wisconsin, we can see that we're doing a pretty terrible job, I would say, as far as managing our northern hardwoods uh, to, to develop a more regulated timber harvesting system um, and really promoting young forest as a percentage or proportion of our overall northern hardwoods management. Um, we can see that we've seen, I mean, really a, about a 400,000 acre decline in our um, zero to 20 age class of, of our northern hardwood type. And very similar to, to the, the aspen management, um, by far the biggest um, weight falls on the shoulders of private non-industrial forest landowners. Um, owning by far the most of the, the land in Wisconsin, we can see that, that that's really where we're seeing a lot of these changes in, in the proportion of, of, of young forest and the transition of our forest to becoming older, more, more mature forests. So it's something that we, we've sort of identified that we really need to, to reach those individuals, uh, at least when looking at Northern hardwoods. When looking at the oak resource, we can tell it in Wisconsin, the situation is extremely problematic. Um, rough grouse will utilize um, oak just as they utilize aspen and, and northern hardwoods and central hardwoods, uh, especially when we talk about the driftless region of, of Wisconsin, southwest, southwest Wisconsin. Um, and we can by far see that we're gonna have a real problem with, uh, with our oak resource um, in, in Wisconsin. And again, um, by far the biggest uh, weight of, of promoting young forest in the oak type falls on um, the private non-industrial landowners outlined in blue. Uh, now admittedly the, this slide this is a little outdated. Uh, it goes back to 2011. I do like this graph however because it breaks it out by, by a five-year age class. And I think really drives, drives home the point visually. But in the uh, effort of fairness we can look at um, a similar type age class graph breaking out the forest types uh, by 20 years. And we still see this, the same trend is that the majority of the, the oak forest type in Wisconsin, based on that, that forestry inventory analysis data, uh, is telling us that areas of improvement we're going to have to address uh, what the private landowners are, are doing on their property and assist them in managing um, young forests as part of part of their uh, land management strategy. Now, specifically speaking, I, I mentioned the driftless area um, and the problems that we're seeing with, with oak management in the driftless area, being that we have less of an aspen resource in southwest Wisconsin compared to northern Wisconsin in managing for rough grouse. Um, just looking at some of the trends going back to 1983 um, with the FIA data, 
about 9% of our forest back then was classified as, as young forest in the Driftless region. Moving forward to today, it's less than 2%. Um, really in the entire 11 county Driftless area, only 65,000 acres could be classified as young forest habitat. And I, I get asked kind of frequently, well, well, does that really matter? I mean, it, it, people say, well, it's the Driftless area, it's not northern Wisconsin where people are rough grouse hunting. Does it really matter for managing young forest in, in southwest Wisconsin? To that, I say yes. Going back to one of the earlier slides and kind of bringing the concepts full circle with drumming counts, um, southwest Wisconsin used to be the mecca for, for rough grouse hunting in Wisconsin, at least going back to the 1970s and 80s. It never used to be northern Wisconsin. Um, Rough grouse were utilizing that oak, central, and northern hardwoods cover type in the driftless area to really coalesce in um, uh, a really good hunting experience <laughs> for, for a lot of uh, individuals. And we've seen kind of along the same trends, the same lines, that decrease in young forest habitat following pretty uh, closely with um, decreases in drumming counts within that region. So. So when we say that, that yes, that, that's important, um, uh, regionally, we have to look at managing not just aspen for, for our young forest, but managing other species as well if we want to um, conserve rough grouse. Now people, people ask, well, um, especially private landowners, uh, of course, many professionals, you guys understand, you talk with, with landowners, they don't see the changes happening, but we can simply even just look at, at aerial photographs uh, for Wisconsin. The oldest flight goes back to the late 1930s, and we can see that change happen before our eyes. Um, as professionals, we maybe have a better understanding of it, and we need the tools to be able to convey that message to private landowners. Um, that the simple message is that our forests are maturing. As they mature, we get a closed canopy condition. When we get that closed canopy condition, we have um, less brush in our forests. Our forests are less diverse. They're more homogenized. They're not meeting that wide diverse forest habitat that species like rough grouse um, really need. Um, here's another example um, from Trempeau County. This is in the Driftless area of Wisconsin where we can observe really the conditions going, going back in time and be able to convey that to landowners that yes, our forests are, are maturing and becoming a closed canopy. So are there any easy solutions um, to this problem that, that we're facing with rough grouse? We're, we're seeing regionally um, decreases in young forest habitat throughout the state. Well, we have some, some solutions at least we've proposed in our, in our state's newly minted rough grouse management plan. Probably the, the, the biggest thing that, that kind of 30,000 foot view is that we want to break the state out into what we call priority regions. Um, something that we're, we're going to do is look at the northern forests, the central region, and the driftless area as three st 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 distinctly different um, management problems. Um, look at how each of those different priority regions is different from a, a standpoint of um, the current grouse population, the current forest condition, uh, the percent of aspen, the percent of young forest in each of those regions. Looking at the distance to mills and product markets and the, the, the ratio of public land, private public forest land to private forest land. Um, of course, for state managers, county managers, it's easier to, to manage our, our public lands, um, get on the same page and manage our public lands uh, on a larger scale than it would be to reach many different individual private landowners, but also addressing, addressing the idea that private landowners have far less red tape to doing management um, than your public land agencies. So how can we engage those private landowners and take advantage of that simple fact that they don't have to go through much of the red tape that, that we do in, in the public land management sector? The idea is that we're going to break the state out into these different regions in piecemeal it to try and make it an easier, um, an easier question to answer. How can we um, make movement on, on this uh, change in, in forest habitat over time? There are 
couple areas of Wisconsin where we're not going to be looking at, at doing rough grouse management simply because of changes in, in land use over time, um, primarily southeastern Wisconsin where there's a lot of urbanization, partial parcelization, and just an overall um, current lack of forest resource um, that's that's needed for, for rough grouse. So there are there are areas of state where we're going to look at not really um, fully addressing, at least in the near term, and try to have these priority areas that we're going to focus in on. Within those, those priority regions, um, we're, we're looking at developing focal areas. Um, dependent upon the region, we could have blocks of forest land, 1,000 acres to 10,000 acres in size, um, depending upon that priority region. We're going to look at having a priority region that has at least 70% aspen or greater, um, especially in the northern forests and transitioning down to a lesser extent down in the driftless area. And we're gonna look at these, these blocks of forest land as uh, um, an opportunity to regulate the aspen harvest, or at least diversify um, the aspen age class and the for actually the overall forest age class um, to better meet that diverse habitat requirements that rough grouse have. We're also looking at opportunities to optimize stand interspersion um, interspersion were a couple of slides that I skipped past where, where really it's the uh, coalescence of, of the different age classes of, of forest type that come together um, to optimize rough grouse habitat. Areas that we can really produce um, um, rough grouse factories, so, so to speak, that can uh, uh, really optimize rough grouse habitat. So that gets down to creating smaller patch size harvests and breaking larger stands of, of timber into smaller ones to increase that, that landscape diversity when it comes to both forest cover type and age class. And when looking at, at strategies in the rough grouse management plan, um, we know that it's, again, it's easier for maybe our, um, our plan to address the needs on, on state and county forest lands in the state of Wisconsin. Um, and we know that there are areas of improvement on on our county and state lands. This, this data comes from um, Wisconsin Forestry Inventory Reporting System. This is a little bit different than FIA data in the state of Wisconsin. This is essentially um, the actual data reported from the field. So we can look at the age class distribution across uh, both DNR and county ownerships in, this, in the state right now. I know the state's working on, on lands um, to be reported in the system um, that are enrolled in the managed forest law program that are on private lands where we can really tackle and focus in on um, on how our private lands are, are rolling into a, a more regulated and diverse uh, aspen resource but we know there are areas of improvement um, that we can at least get to in the immediate term um, through developing those priority regions in those focal areas in our state for aspen as well as oak um, you know, again, DNR, county, and feds have by far the smallest proportion of, of oak as a, as a resource in our state. Um, really, the job and the duty is going to fall upon how we as managers reach out to private landowners and engage them in managing forest cover type um, to help, help move that needle on, on young forest habitat. But we do know that there are areas of improvement, at least in the near term, on our county and DNR lands to help develop more of a regulated um, oak age class distribution in our state. And with that, I'm going to open up to questions. Uh, great. Uh, well, thanks, John. Uh, great presentation. Great set of slides. Um, we do have a couple of questions coming in online. Um, again, if you are online, um, encourage you to use the chat area. Uh, that should be in the lower left side of uh, where you are in the chat window. Um, a couple of questions uh, going back to uh, kind of basic biology, John. Um, is there a way to tell the difference between males and females at a distance? I heard it has something to do with the coloration of the tail. Um, there, there is. Um, you know, as a hunter, looking at them, examining them in flight, it's relatively hard. I actually have a slide here. Let me scroll through, see if I can find it. Here we go. Um, 
you know, when the birds are in flight, it's pretty hard to tell the difference, um, especially if you're, if you're a hunter trying to, to shoot the bird. And I guess the biggest, uh, the easiest way to really kind of tell is the, the two terminal tail feathers. Basically on a female, um, there's about a 70% chance. Um, I, wait, I, I need to I need to remember how to say it because it's kind of an oxymoron. <laughs> On males, they will have an unbroken tail band. Um, there'll be a black band that extends from from um, both ends of the tail. But on females and some males, there'll be there'll be two of the terminal tail feathers that band will, will be broken. Um, so that that's why you know I, I said birds are monomorphic, and when you go out hunting rough grouse, um, you know unlike pheasant hunting, you're not just shooting roosters; you're shooting and and or. Um, males and females but after you harvest that bird you can definitely help go through sort of the, the um, breakdown how to determine if it's a male or female looking at the terminal tail feathers um, of course if you have an unbroken band it's going to be a male if it is broken um, it could be a male or a female then you actually have to look at examining the rump feathers um, the rump feathers if they have one dot it's a female if it has two dots, it's a male, and I'll I'll let you guys uh, figure out how you're going to remember that one. Great, thanks, John. Um, another question: Going back to the harvest rates and the grouse populations, uh, it looks like the harvest rate of hunted grouse is correlated to the number of hunting days. Uh, does that mean it is or is not well correlated to the actual grouse population? I, I, th I think it is, um, but I, I maybe more than others just like to issue caution when, when looking at data, but I, I think we could. And, and I guess one of the reasons I, I say that is that, is that, you know, going back to the drumming surveys in 2017, we all thought um, managers, hunters, and landowners alike that um, the hunting was going to be great in 2017. It, it didn't pan out. So sometimes we have to be cautious. It's just looking at the data and, and what inferences we can make. Great, thanks. Uh, lots of good questions coming in. Um, another one from one of our broadcast sites at the North Central Research and Outreach Station. Um, how does competition with other bird species like turkey affect grouse population? Um, th that's actually something that uh, um, Wisconsin, as we were diving into our, our rough grouse management plan, we actually, we, de we debated it if we were going to include a segment um, kind of, I, I don't know if you want to call it breaking the myth on, on turkey and rough grouse interactions, but we felt that there was enough um, feedback from the public that we, we felt we had to address that as a, as a resource concern. So what the, what the literature is, is telling us right now, and if you have some really in-depth questions, I would actually recommend searching on the Wisconsin DNR's website. Our draft version of that plan is currently up. Um, the, final, the final plan is approved, but it just isn't up on the website yet. That'll break more into, into those interactions. But what we know right now is that um, the research is telling us that there is no interaction. Um, turkey and grouse are utilizing slightly different habitats um, especially during the nesting period. You know, there, there are some concerns about direct nest predation of, of uh, um, turkey on rough grouse. And what we, what we can kind of deduce is some of those concerns may be coming out of um, the southern United States where turkeys have been um, observed feeding on quail nests. And there, there might be some observations in Wisconsin of, of turkey feeding on rough grouse nests, but it's also kind of key to point out that that could simply mean that a turkey is feeding on an abandoned nest or that uh, the grouse have already hatched. They could be coming along and just eating the eggshells themselves for the calcium. Um, so they, they may not actually be predating on a nest itself. Um, but what we know, no, no interaction. Uh, interesting. Thanks, John. Um, another question you mentioned all the great work that's been done with the Wisconsin Rough Grouse Management Plan, but um, how do the trends in the population compare to Minnesota in rough grouse populations? 
Um, I, I think in Minnesota, Minnesota is a little bit different than Wisconsin. I think Minnesota has kind of heard the message loud and clear, at least that the rough grouse has kind of put out over the years that, that, you know, managers, private landowners, uh, young forest habitat is important. Um, I, th I think Minnesota has done a better job, at least on the public lands of getting that message. I think there's, there's still some work to be done on, on the forest service lands, but they're, they're, they're making strides um, towards that. Um, but I think, I think maybe the pendulum has swung a little bit too heavily when you start looking at the county, industrial, and um, state-managed lands where we may be starting to swing the pendulum too much towards uh, young forest habitat. We need to start remembering, well, we have to have diverse forest habitat for rough grouse. We need a, a regulated uh, aspen harvest. But I, th I think, you know, the message of, of by far the um, – the weight is put on the shoulders of private landowners and individuals. Um, you know, that, that's still just regionally in, in the upper great lakes. I mean, you can even extend it to, to just the Eastern United States. That's where we're seeing um, some of the biggest losses of, of young forest habitat. So it kind of gets back into this idea that we you know us as managers, we're doing a really good job of taking care of our own shop, but we're kind of ignoring, um, rolling everybody else into uh, um, into the management. But of course, Minnesota is not, um, they're not exempt from a lot of the pressures that Wisconsin is facing, at least when it comes to the forest products market. Because of course, a lot of the stuff really relies upon a strong forest products market. And if we simply don't have that, we're going to have a lot of hardship going forward, um, managing a wide range of, of wildlife habitat, not just rough grouse habitat. So, Great. so they're they're not they're not free from some of the market woes that we've seen here. Uh, thanks, John. Um, a lot of great questions still coming in. Uh, it's coming up on about one o'clock, but uh, we'll stay through and continue to answer these questions um, as folks have them. Um, one going back to the figure you showed of the hardwood succession, the Gordy Gullion figure. Um, the question is, it looked like all the aspects of forest use are covered by the range of forest stand ages through about age 50. Is that the right way to look at the figure, or are there other significant benefits for rough grouse to provide age classes older than that that maybe aren't covered by the older age classes? You know, I, I, I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of truth in saying that. Um, they are be, be, before age, age 50, but I, I would still, again, issue some caution there and, and what inferences you, you want to draw from it. Um, there was one study, um, I'm trying to remember the state, I think it may, may have even been the um, Virginia, um, where rough grouse were found nesting in about 200 year old, uh, I, believe, I believe a short leaf pine. So there, there can be some, some wide plasticity in the, their use of, of older age classes as well, especially when it comes to nesting cover. But you, you have to remember that you're managing um, that aspen resource in time. And there may be some other species that benefit if we let some stands get a little bit older. The benefits for rough grouse may start to drop out, but the benefits for other wildlife species may start picking up. So kind of you kind of have to really focus in on um, what are you trying to manage? Um, you know, I, we, we do also have to, to acknowledge though, that again, getting back to the forest products market, if we let too much of this aspen age too old, or too, if we get too much old aspen, it kind of degra degrades pretty rapidly as far as quality goes. So we, we, we while we maybe we do want to acknowledge um, managing older age class for other wildlife benefits, we may end up just shooting ourselves in the foot because um, if we have a degraded stand that we actually can't get harvested and put to market um, for timber harvest, we may lose the opportunity to do management in that stand. Um, but I, 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 th I think the best way of describing it goes back to uh, uh, one of my old civil culture uh, instructors used to say is that it all depends. <laughs> um, you know, how, how we let these stands age, what age we actually wanna go in and do a harvest at um, is largely going to be based upon uh, the site history and the soils of that stand. Um, I've harvested some aspen stands as young as 35, 
simply because the, the, the soils couldn't really support beyond that. They're, they're too droughty, too dry, too sandy. Um, in other instances, I've let some aspen stands go um, to 65 years, especially big tooth aspen stands if I wanted, if I was trying to take advantage um, of some niche markets for, for some high quality um, boltwood um, big tooth aspen. So it, it all depends. Thanks, John. Uh, another one, going back, you know, you showed great aerial photos of the 1930s compared to today. Uh, the question is, isn't the 1934s kind of the leftover of the late 19th century devastation? Um, and wouldn't that just mean that, well, our forests are just getting mature anyway? Um, so where does rough grouse, you know, management fit into kind of forest maturation, I think is the question. You know, I, that, that's, that's maybe a bit more of a philosophical question, you know, because we're, we're always trying to, forest restorationists are always trying to restore forests back to a point in time, or at least that, that's the, um, the concept, of the, the gist of it. Um, I would say definitely our, our, our rough growth population is kind of a, a factor that we currently have right now of, of our past management history um, and our current land use. Does it mean that we should completely abandon rough grouse management currently and then try to um, manage what was here historically? Um, you know, Wisconsin used to be mostly sharp-tailed grouse and prairie chicken habitat at one point in time. But of course, that was a factor of, of really the great cutover um, and then a strong history of uh, prescribed burning by, by Native Americans um, prior to European settlement. We, we we shouldn't, as managers, at least I believe, get hung up as on trying to manage our, our forest back to a certain point in time, um, um, and it's sort of a, a restoration type type theme. And this is, you know, maybe my my personal preference. So I'm not saying this is the the word of God here, but uh, uh, I think we should be trying to manage our forests and our landscape to be diverse, um, to manage for a wide range of wildlife species. Um, including game and non-game species. But if we're seeing losses or declines in rough grouse in one region where we know we have the opportunity to manage them and keep them on the landscape, um, keep hunting opportunities in front of um, private landowners, private individuals, hunters, and keep conservation dollars flowing in um, to the North American model of, of wildlife management, I think we should be taking advantage of those opportunities. Um, but I, I think really the core of that, that type of question is that, yes, we should be managing for a diversity of, of wildlife species and landscape. Great. Um, another question about going back to the goals, and I think this is related to the Wisconsin plan. Um, it's interesting that one of your goals is to decrease stand, stand size. That is to decrease stand size. Is there any additional context that surrounds that goal? Uh, in Minnesota, our stands have gotten so small on average that we are generally trying to find large blocks of forest or create them where they might be helpful toward that goal. Now, this is this kind of is some of the slides that I, I skipped over that that I wish I had actually uh, had, had covered, but uh, we we can do it now. Um, I would say say yes. You know, the idea is is reducing our stand size. It, you can only do it so so far. You know, we have some concerns of. Um, uh, forest economics. If we try to reduce our stand size so much, nobody's going to come in and, and harvest a stand of timber um, without paying them to do it. So we, we want the forest economics to work out where somebody's still capable of coming in and, and conducting a timber harvest on a smaller stand. But the idea with making a smaller patch size harvests is that we can increase edge habitat and the interspersion of different age classes. And so the the classic sort of rough grouse management example is taking 40 acres of aspen and breaking it into four different 10 acre harvests, harvesting it every 10 years. So that basically at, at any given time on that property, we have four different age classes. We're always maintaining young forest on that, that 40 acres. Um, that's, that's a good strategy, but uh, there's, it's a little bit misleading in that we're not really trying to target on that 40 acres the young forest habitat, we're trying to manage the interspersion of where those four different habitats come together 
Um, Cause that's where we actually create a grouse factory. That's where we're meeting the diverse forest habitat needs and requirements of rough grouse. Um, so, so that, that where th that's where that management strategy of breaking down stand size um, and creating more diversity of, of age classes comes into play is that we're really trying to increase the interspersion of, of different age classes by doing so. Um, and, and I think similarly to, uh, to, you know, the limitations of the forest economics as a rough grouse hunter, you know, I, I believe there are also some limitations to that stand size. You know, personally, I'd, I don't want to run my dog through a stand that's one acre in size and have to run through a hundred of those. I would rather run through uh, 25 acre stands, um, so to speak, um, hunting rough grouse. So there, I think there's some give and take there. Great, a, a grouse diet question. Uh, do grouse eat acorns and other mass species? They do. Um, so that's, that's actually, this year was a really major uh, acorn crop, uh, at least in Wisconsin. And a lot of uh, hunters I talked to myself examining the crops of, of rough grouse found a lot of acorns. It's kind of amazing that they can chomp down an acorn, but they'll, they'll do it. Um, I think uh, uh, this is kind of, I'm trying to remember back, but I think it makes up 30% of their diet when acorns are available. Um, so not throughout the entire year. It's really um, uh, when acorns are available, they'll make up 30% of their diet. So that, that, that there again gets back to the importance of not just managing an aspen resource, um, but a diverse forest resource as well. Great. And going back to the previous question about uh, harvest size uh, and kind of your, your thoughts on staggering timber harvests, uh, the question is, what is the range of harvest size in acres of young forests that create uh, clear cuts, and how, do, how does that benefit grouse? And so the range of harvest size in acres uh, for these young clear cuts. Well, so um, again, it was on some of the slides I skipped past, but uh, the home range of rough grouse is actually relatively small. Um, while they are the most widely distributed uh, resident upland game bird in North America, after they disperse, um, uh, from the brood uh, in the fall and they find their their sort of habitat that they're going to utilize for the remainder of their life it's only about 20 acres in size so it's actually relatively small their, their home range so the idea is when you really want to find these areas of opportunity to create these so-called grouse factories you really have to key on an areas where you can meet this wide range of habitat requirements within about 20 acres so it, it's, it's surprisingly small, but, um, you know, that, that's where breaking up a hundred acre timber sale into, um, two or three different sales and you have that edge, edge habitat, that edge effect, you may, as, as this one, um, diagram has several areas of, of, I wouldn't say premier, but far better rough grouse habitat where you may have a really good interspersion of those, those age classes. Great, and then um, looking at uh, fire. Uh, so what role does fire suppression and how, the, how does fire suppression impact grouse populations? So there, <clears throat> there are some studies that, um, well, first off, fire, fire is a great tool for, for forest regeneration. I mean, obviously it can have some devastating effects when, when you have an escaped wildfire um, that, that go against really what you're targeting and trying to manage for. But as far as forest regeneration and regenerating the type of stands that that were that grouse will utilize and optimize, it's it's a great tool. Um, there were some studies out of the eastern United States looking at um, simply stem density after wildfire compared to traditional timber harvesting techniques, and what and prescribed fire showed that uh, uh, by far had better stem density, um, so you're getting better rough grouse utilization. Um, but I think, I think there, there are some really good effects that can be gleaned as far as um, understory vegetation, herb forb, and shrub development, um, especially creating a diversity of food resources on the ground. Um, looking at that, it, it's really kind of creating a, div a diverse understory. Um, that way you have a wider range of foods that rough grouse can, can feed upon different seeds, um, fruits, uh, herbs, and forbs, as well as insect diversity as well. 
So I, I think there, there are definitely areas of opportunity. Great. Um, those are all the online questions I'm seeing. We had one question here in St. Paul about hazelnuts. Um, seeing kind of a bumper crop of hazelnuts this last year. So what's the role of hazelnuts in grouse? Uh, similar to oak, they, they will um, they will eat the nut themselves. Uh, uh, they, they can chomp down a, a, a hazelnut. Um, but more importantly, they're feeding upon the buds and catkins of, of hazelnut. And they're also util utilizing the hazelnut as a cover. Um, so it, multiple benefits gleaned from hazelnut. And then Dave has a question here in St. Paul. You should be able to hear him. If not, I can relay the question. Yeah, just say uh, here in Minnesota over the last 25 years, we've had a very substantial decline in timber harvest. And, and virtually all of that is because of decline in harvest in private land, uh, in roughly flat in public land. I'm generalizing over the last 25 years. Um, Assuming there's, I don't know what the trends are across the lake states as a whole or just in Wisconsin, except I think there's been a decline in harvest as, as well. I was wondering if you've done any correlations of decline in overall timber harvest and decline in rough grouse populations. I, I think I think there's there's something to be said there. You know, Wisconsin and Minnesota have, have been kind of in a similar history. The past several decades, losing losing different forest product markets, um, that definitely benefited rough grouse. And the way we also look at it is just the the loss of opportunity with with what mills could we have um, plugged into our states um, over the past couple decades. But uh, I think you know, big thirty thousand foot view, looking looking regionally uh, or in or throughout the eastern United States, we still have a really strong timber market um, or timber industry in, in the upper Great Lakes. So we're, we're pretty fortunate in that regard uh, compared to a lot of the Eastern states. You know, we still have pulp mills here. Um, we still have paper mills, which it, it are really beneficial for, for managing rough grouse. Of course, a lot of the, the clear cut and coppice type harvests that are done uh, to regenerate aspen um, uh, work really well with, with managing um, pulp species for, for the paper mills. Um, but I, I think there, there's definitely something to be said for, for loss of, uh, um, not really loss, but our, our decline in the timber industry um, in the Great Lakes um, affecting rough grouse habitat and just the amount of wood that can get to market. Because that, that, that is one of the um, concepts that does need to be, you know, explained is that, you know, let's get all gung-ho about clear-cutting these woods creating some age class diversity that's do good by, by the rough grouse. But if we don't have a place to actually send the wood, the management itself becomes really difficult on the ground. Right. Um, one of the forest service individuals I work with here in Wisconsin, he talks uh, quite frequently about going back to the 1970s. There used to be no market for, um, for Aspen in Wisconsin. So they used, used to just bulldoze Aspen stands down. Uh, to create the habitat, you know, and that's, that's the type of situation that we, we quite frankly don't want to get back to. It's a, that's a very costly type of management to keep rough grouse on the landscape. Um, so I think anything that we can do um, legislatively, uh, consumer wise, um, to utilize wood products over other products or resources, I think is, is def definitely beneficial when you realize that it starts to benefit um, on the ground management. Great, I think we have just one more online question. Um, what about the role of conifers? Uh, how do conifers fit into, you know, this short rotation concept that is, um, say you have a hypothetical 40 acres and you divide that into 10 acres and you cut that every 10 years. Uh, what about conifers and grouse management? Yeah, so so that, that example I gave, you know, that that's the um, that's the classic example in, in the, the south in the bottom right hand corner. That's a classic example where you have that 40 acre stand. But of course, you know, if you're a private landowner, you never have that exact scenario. You never have 40 acres of aspen. You're going to have a red pine plantation that you or your grandfather put in. You're going to have a creek or a, a tag alder stand or um, an oak stand or something of that nature. So you never have that classic example. So 
Um, you have to take advantage of what resource you have on your property. Um, and even this is an example, this is a real world example from a county forest in Wisconsin, in central Wisconsin. This is the Frank Vasquez uh, rough grouse and woodcock management area on that county forest. And the, the different shades of green um, basically outline different age class goals for, um, for Aspen that, that that property is managing. But you can see that the kind of that uh, um, purple color, that's the, those are conifer stands. Um, the pink salmon color, that, those are hardwood stands. And we have some, some wetland alder kind of um, thrown in there as well. So, so yeah, when you manage your property for that diversity of age classes, you're gonna have other resources kind of thrown in there. Doesn't mean that you can't manage for, for rough grouse at all. You just have to kind of take that into consideration. Um, I wouldn't promote um, cutting down your conifer um, to favor aspen. Um, uh, I wouldn't favor cutting down your aspen to favor conifer either. Um, you kind of just have to go with, with what you have. And I do have um, a slide here at the end uh, it talks a little bit about conifer management. Um, so rough grouse will, they do this, this thing where they, they'll snow roost. Um, so in the winter time, when it starts getting frigid and cold out, um, they're trying to escape the cold temperatures. They're also trying to escape predation. Uh, so they'll actually dive into that about, uh, about a foot of nice fluffy snow and conceal themselves underneath the, um, the snow in a, in a roost. And what they're trying to do there is the concealment, but also reduce heat loss. And they're trying to better thermal regulate their bodies. And this, um, this table, uh, this graph on, on the, the bottom, shows basically the amount of fat needed in grams per day by a rough grouse um, in different scenarios compared to open habitat, um, conifer, mature woods, or how, many, how much they're actually using in a snow roost. So you can look at, at the conifer column and it, it's not too much better than just being open and, and exposed. Um, however, if we get years like we had you know, the past two years, weren't really the, the best snow years for creating snow roosts for rough grouse. If that's all they have, well, that's all they have. So it, it's, it's good to have something where they can, they can escape to um, into that thermal cover in the conifers. Plus, just talking about um, general wildlife um, usage, you will get get other species like like white-tailed deer utilizing conifer stands um, as thermal cover in the winter time as well. Um, and in Minnesota, you guys do have um, a spruce grouse that you can actually manage for in conifer stands as well. So there there are definitely opportunities in utilizing that on your property. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much, John. Uh, this has been a great webinar. I, I think we've got all the questions from online. Um, a quick message, uh, we are recording this, uh, so you will get a recording of this. We'll send that in a follow-up email, um, along with a lot of these resources that uh, John mentioned today, including the Wisconsin Rough Grouse Management Plan, uh, and maybe a document on the West Nile results. Um, so John, thank you for your webinar from the five of us here in St. Paul. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I would encourage everybody, um, you know, I, I mentioned a, a few times uh, the state of Wisconsin's rough grouse management plan. Just putting a plug in for that again as well. If you go to, um, you know, I'm an, I'm an RGS biologist, but I'm promoting the, the DNR's management plan because I helped write it. Uh, but if you go to the Wisconsin DNR's um, website and just search uh, rough grouse management, you can find the management plan tab and uh, give that a peruse and, and encourage you to learn more about rough grouse. Uh, thank you, John. Um, and I had one thing uh, we wanted to uh, do. We have one slide to present today. Um, uh, and that's to thank Madison Rodman. Um, and so this is Madison's last SFUC event, uh, we think. Um, and so Madison, as many of you know, has been very helpful in uh, for the last two and a half years with SFUC um, and the University of Minnesota um, in doing programming uh, for SFUC. Uh, and she's really done so much behind the scenes uh, at workshops through these webinars. I know for me, I had a little bit of anxiety as we were switching our webinar platforms uh, about in the middle of this year sometime. 
but Madison really helped us through all that. So uh, Madison is starting a new position with Minnesota Sea Grant. Um, and so Madison, we wish you the best in the new position uh, and just want to let you know that we'll miss you all, uh, but uh, we will uh, certainly be in touch. So thank you, Madison. And that concludes our webinar. So we'll, uh, we'll sign off now. Thanks again to John as well. Thank you.